Welcome to Advanced Data Analysis 1 with me, Eric Ehrt, Professor of Statistics at the University of New Mexico. In this video, I will help get you started with regression diagnostics for simple li linear regression. We will get to cover this in much more detail next semester in Advanced Data Analysis 2. And this is the video that you're watching. I'll probably also have a supplement, which will be the code that we'll look at in this video. We're going to look at my lecture notes for Chapter 9 historically chapter 8, um, Regression and Diagnostics. Oh, and I've already opened that in another tab because I've zoomed in the appropriate amount. Now we're looking at a simple linear regression. So how does y relate to x in a linear way? Okay, And the model assumptions here are that these error terms, the vertical distances, around the regression line are independent, which is something that you cannot uh, verify after the fact. It's a function of how you collected the data. Um, the residuals aren't normally distributed, and we can check the distribution of those. And they have zero mean. That is automatically guaranteed based on how the residuals are um, formed. and variance sigma squared. And the main thing about the variance sigma squared is that you have a single variance. That is, the variance for the error terms are equal over all of them. Okay, So that is what we're going to be checking here. All right, and I guess I've enumerated them all right here. All right, um, I've got four cases here, one where we've got a data points with x going from 1 to 5, y going roughly from 8 to 20, and in this panel A we have a straight line relationship where the variance is pretty consistent across all of those. That would probably meet, uh, satisfy the model assumptions. In panel B we have a linear relationship, but you can see that the variance is small when x is small and is large when x is large. So the variance here is non-constant. Um, the fancy words uh, for that are homoscedastic, when you have constant variance, right? Homo is the same, and for the different variants, heteroscedastic, okay? So we have heteroscedasticity in panel B, homoscedasticity in panel A. In panel C, we have non-curvature, but the variance is roughly the same. So here you might consider um, a not maybe a linear model, but maybe a polynomial, like a parab parabola, um, a quadratic function. Um, alternatively, you could transform y, maybe by taking the log or the square root so that this is a straight line relationship. You do have some negative values right here, so you might want to add some amount first, shift, shift the y values up by adding you know, 10 or 20, and then take the, the log, though you may then um, have too little variance on those higher points once you've taken the transformed uh, value there. Here I would probably use a non-linear um, relationship like a quadratic. And the last panel D we've got both a curved relationship and non-constant variance. This is a great case where a log transform would probably um, solve the problem provided all your values are positive, all your y values. All right, um, so uh, most of the assumptions, uh, actually I'll say all of the assumptions, um, except for um, sort of independence, is, are based on the residuals, that um, the residuals are uh, have constant variance and normally distributed. Okay? So if we can verify that, and we don't have any other funny business going on, and we'll talk about outliers and leverage uh, shortly, then we can trust our model and go on to interpret it. Our residuals um, represent with the letter E because historically they're called errors. Um, the error is just the difference between what you observed and what you predicted. So if you're, because your prediction doesn't match what you observed, that's how much error your prediction made. Um, I'll, but we will tend to call them residuals. It's what you observe, yi, versus the predicted value from the model, the hat 
y hat um, says that that's the model prediction. Um, the standard errors for the error terms, so how much how much should the residuals vary, um, actually depends on the value of x. So when you are in the middle of the data, you have the most information about how much variability there is. And in that case, uh, we can estimate that error very precisely. And so when xi is equal to x bar, this numerator equals zero. And so this, this whole uh, term on the right is equal to zero. And so the, the residual standard error is equal to, let's see if I've got an equation, no, um, is equal to basically the, the, the root mean squared error um, times the square root of one over, well, one over n, okay? Um, this denominator is just the sum of all the x's and how far they are from the mean um, squared up, okay? So the sum of the squares of the x values. If as xi gets further from x bar, this numerator increases, and so this, standard, this whole term increases, and so when you get on the on the right and left tails of the x distribution, we have more uncertainty. So we will see um, error bands for a confidence band for the regression line have sort of an hourglass shape, horizontal, um, where it's most narrow at x bar. Okay. Um, there's something called studentized residuals, which is the best type of residuals to use, um, where it basically makes sure that the standard error of these residuals is constant um, by, by correcting the size of the residual based on its, its standard error. Okay, um, here's a situation of perfection. <laughs> We've got um, x versus y. We have a straight line relationship. We want to look at the residuals. The, so on the y-axis, we have the vertical distance between each observation and in this case, uh, it's, it's uh, relative to the regression line. So the regression line here is zero. It's as though we took this, this uh, relationship here and just, um, actually I think it's probably this way for you, and just put the regression line perfectly horizontal, okay? So anything that's on that regression line, any points that are on the regression line have a residual of zero. So that's the zero point for residuals and here, because every model, depending regardless of how many x variables you have, has a fitted value, we often plot, if there's one residual plot to make, it's relative to the residuals, or excuse me, relative to the fitted values. So here we go from 10 to 25. So this is, the fitted values are y hat. So we're basically going along the y axis, okay? And we're relating it to the hat values, the predicted value for the regression line. So um, you can see that the this all this data looks just anyway. This point in the top right corner is above the line. That's this point over here, where x excuse me the fitted value is equal to 25. So here the fitted value is equal to 25. Okay, um, and on the left we've got two points above. That's these two points here, and one point below. That's this one point down here. So when it's on this horizontal axis, it's much easier to see patterns. For example, your eye might start to think that there's this downward curvature happening here. Um, it probably is not really there. That's our ultimate power, uh, pattern recognition powers, sort of overpowering our, us and, and finding um, details that aren't there. It's called aprophenia, when you detect patterns that aren't there. All right. Oh, I clicked on something and it jumped somewhere. Uh, let's see where it jumped. Sorry, I might need to scroll way down again. Okay, we're getting close. That's where we were. All right, so um, here are four cases um, of, well actually these are two regression cases. On the left we've got um, the data we have a positive slope here, and we've got uh, these other residuals 
for that. And here we see this cone shape where we have little variants on the left and lots of variants on the right. That's a case where you might want to use weighted regression when you have unequal variants. Um, it's unlikely that a transformation is going to solve this variance problem. Here we've got, cur definitely we have curvature. And so a straight line relationship is clearly not the right model. And you can see that just as well on the residual plot. Okay. All right. Um, here are uh, two cases. Uh, one, right? Is there one just below here? Oh, actually, okay. So this is one case of a an outlier and um, what it might be, uh, how, how it's maybe easier to see it in the residual plot than in the, the original plot. We have uh, X versus Y. We've got all the data lining up, but we have this one point right here. Now this point itself is not a, an outlier in terms of the Y, ver y variables or the Y... Uh, y variable, right? Sort of in, in terms of the y-axis that goes from negative 15 to 40, it's a 25. So it's somewhere in the middle. And in terms of x, that goes from 2.5 up to almost 8, it's a 7. So it's near the right side, but it's not an outlier in either axis. But um, it is an outlier overall. And when you t t take the regression line and look at the residuals by making the regression line basically equal to zero, horizontal, you can see this point miles below everything else. Furthermore, the regression line, which is the zero line for residuals, does not follow the pattern of the data, right? The, re the line is sort of too high on the left and too low on the right. And we're going to, that's because this point has a lot of influence and leverage, it's pulling down on that side, I guess for you it's this way, pulling down on the regression line and changing the slope. So we're going to see a couple more examples of that soon. So, But this is like where you can, where the residual plots um, help you identify um, really extreme observations. All right. Um, Let's look at a couple cases of non-constant variance. I've got code here that produces it. All right. Um, I'm here relating the visual illusion of constant sample size um, or sample size with variance. Okay. So on the le top left, we've got um, constant variance over the values of x from 0 to 4. And every one of these situations has the same sample size. Okay, and you can see there's already quite a bit of variability here. You know, one looks less variable than two, but they're all generated from the same distribution. So in fact, the true vari variance for all these points is the same. In the right, we have the, still the same variance, but different sample sizes, okay? So here we've got just three points clustered real small. Here we've got five points a bit more, and two is really spread out, Three is actually less spread than two, but has m more points, and four has the most. Now, by looking at this, you might judge that these have different variances, but they all have the same variance. You have very little information about the variance when you have very small sample sizes. And it is a consequence of large sample sizes that you're going to see more extreme observations. Right. This is why countries with lots of people win the Olympics, because you've got more extreme people in terms of abilities when you have when you have millions of people and you can scoop off the last, you know, the top 20 people in the country to compete. Um, and it, when you compete against countries with small populations, they don't have those long those tails of the most extreme people. Um, so, so expect to see more variance as the sample size goes up, meaning more spread of the data as the sample size goes up, even though the variance is constant. Okay. Um, in the bottom left, we have the same sample size, but the variance is increasing. Okay. So all the points are clustered here at zero, and then the points spread out more and more. And on the right, we have variance is changing and the sample size is also changing, okay? 
So it's sort of um, accentuated even more that as you increase the sample size and the variance, you get more spread for two reasons, right? All right. Um, normality is um, is check can be checked in several ways. There are normality um, hypothesis tests. A common one is the Shapiro Wilk test. There's Anderson Darling. There's uh, Ryan Joyner. There's several others. Actually, there's dozens of others. <laughs> um, in my opinion, it is uh, these tests um, are generally not very good in terms of determining normality. It's better to look at a visualization of it and and to make a visual determination. Um, there's a oh, when I click somewhere, it just jumps to a weird place. Sorry about that. Oh, I think I went too far. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, you cannot check independence. Um, you need to know that the data were collected um, such that in such a way that the observations would be independent from each other, that the value of one observation wouldn't influence the value of another observation, right? Um, outliers, we'll look at um, outliers in several plots here and discuss those. And influential observations, points can be influential in a number of different ways, and I'm going to show you a few examples. So here are uh, the two examples I like to use for inf influence. Um, when we think of outliers, outliers can be outliers in either the y direction, the x direction, or both. On the left, we've got a situation where this observation up, way up here is right in the middle of x. So it's not an, out not an outlier for the x direction, but it clearly is not an outlier in the y direction. And you see the result of that is that it's pulling the regression line up from the middle. So with the point, we have the solid line. But if you were to remove this observation, the whole regression line goes down to the dashed line. And now the dashed line fits the data very well, whereas with the point, it this line sort of overestimates the value for almost all of the, the values in the data set. In the second example on the right, here's a point way up in the top right. Um, now this point is an outlier in the x direction and in the y direction. And because of that, um, just like if you have a pipe like or say a wrench with a really long handle, um, you can get a lot of leverage torquing a bolt or a nut, right? And so that's what's happening here. This point, it, if you, with the regression, excuse me, with that point, the regression line basically follows that point. Is sort of, the data set basically has like two clumps. It has one clump in the bottom co left corner of points, and it's got another clump of just one point in the top right corner. And so the regression line is going to go through those two points. That's effectively what's happening. But if you remove that point, the slope is basically zero, sort of horizontal, because there's no structure in the data here. It's just sort of a circular clump. So this point was able to pull the regression line from horizontal way up to be uh, very diagonal. Okay. All right, so that is a case of high leverage. Now points that are that are outliers in the x direction are called uh, are said to have high leverage. They are not necessarily influential. In particular, if this point, instead of being way up in the top right corner, was close to this dashed line, it would have high leverage out here at x equals 10, but it wouldn't have influence because it would not have changed the fit of the regression model without the point, with or without the point, sort of the, about roughly the same. So often um, a high leverage point does have influence, but it doesn't always, and so we need to assess that. All right. All right. Cook's distance is a statistic that helps us determine how much influence a point has on the model fit. And it effectively uh, compares two sets of fitted values. So 
for all the observations, um, except for the Jth observation, it compares the, the fitted model, or excuse me, the model fits with that point in there compared to the model fits without that point in the model. So, for example, in this, this is probably the easiest one to look at, with this point way up here in the data set, the regression line is the solid black line. Without that point, the fitted line is the dashed line. So for each observation, which are the black points, we have the black line point, the fitted point on the black line, and we have the fitted value on the dashed line. And the difference between those two is this difference here, with that point and without that point. And we do that for all the points, um, square them, add them up, and that is the Cook's distance. How much the, the predictions changed when you removed one observation. And you do that for all the observations and you get the influence for each observation. Okay, And we're going to look at those Cook's distances. I recommend that you read this content from the chapter. So let's take a look at four cases and see um, what types of outliers we have. On the left here, um, how much influence do each of these four individual points have? So if you remove each one, this, the fitted, you know, first of all, the structure of this data is we've got a clump on the left and a clump on the right, right? The clump on the left with four observations. If you remove any one, the regression line is going to move up and down a little bit, but not very much. If you remove the point on the right, the regression line is going to follow this line, which is going to be uh, extremely different than this downward sloping line. So this point out here has influence because of its leverage, uh, because it's an outlier in the x direction, but also because it's just not consistent with the pattern of the rest of the data on the left hand side. In the top right corner, uh, we have a, an example where no point really has much leverage or um, influence. If you remove any single point, the line's going to have basically the similar slope over here. Um, the points with the highest leverage are the ones, you know, in the left tail and the right tail. Right in the middle is would be a, you know, a space where the leverage is equal to zero because it's equal to x bar. Um, on the left, we have sort of a complicated situation. We've got a clump of points on the left and then a point on the right, but this time, just like the top left panel, um, we've added, we've added a point to that left clump. So similar situation, I guess, on the left-hand side, if you remove any single point on the left, it doesn't change very much. If you remove the one on the right, now what is the slope? It's not following these four points in, an, in a po steep positive slope, but it might be sort of more horizontal. So it still has quite a bit of leverage, but not quite as much because this one point dampens the effect of these four in the slope. Um, it's almost like these two points t together are somehow different than these four, or maybe these four are just a coincidence that they line up, right? Um, on the right-hand side, it's like the top left, but now we've got two outlying points. And so if you remove either one of these by themselves, the slope of this line is not really going to change very much. And, you know, with such a small data set of six points, it's really hard to say that these are um, sort of unusual in terms of the structure of the data set. Um, you would really need a lot more observations to determine what's going on. But the point is that if, if say, you had more points on the left that had this positive slope, Cook's distance would not reveal either of these points on the right as being influential because removing one of them doesn't make a big change in the fitted values of the regression model. So it, it's an imperfect measure. Now you can go through Cook's distance and remove all pairs of points or all triplets of points um, and see if combinations of points are highly um, influential. But there's sort of a point where... Um, you're getting diminishing returns. You have to look at so many cases um, that it's not really worth all that effort. And there are 
maybe other diagnostics that can help reveal this sort of influence on the model. <clears throat> all right. Um, all right. So some <clears throat> brief suggestions about what to do. Um, always plot the data. Um, not just summaries of the data, not just regression lines, but all the data points. Um, uh, if you've got different groups, color and change the symbols of the plotting points by group so you can really see the structure of the data. Um, are there any obvious transformations? If so, go ahead and, and perform some of those transformations and replot the data and look at it. Um, fit the model and then examine the residuals. Um, we're going to, I'm going to show you a function that just does all the residual plotting automatically. Um, check for, um, uh, check for curvature in the residuals or, or not non-constant variance. All right. That megaphone pattern, um, check for outliers. Uh, I'll show you how to assess normality. And if, is there a pattern? for the residuals versus the order of the data. This is most important when you are, when your data are sorted based on the order that they were collected in, because maybe there's some patterns in a variance. Um, for example, maybe you're collecting uh, some survey data and you're standing outside the student union building and it's lunchtime and then, and you know, you've you've maybe talked to it with a bunch of faculty and staff members in the morning, and then there's this rush for people having lunch, and mostly students. And now you're collecting lots of data for students, and then in the afternoon, maybe you go back and you're collecting data from staff and faculty members again, right? Well, the variance for faculty and staff might be different from the variance for students, particularly students who are being measured consecutively, because maybe people who are similar answer the survey similar and those similar people are hanging out together as friends. So uh, there may be some some structure to the data there that your observations are related to each other and you would want to account for that in your model. Those considerations are not part of this class but um, just things that you need to be thinking about. Um, check out for the Cook's distance. Um, how much influence do they have, and also check um, Cook's distance versus leverages, so that if you do see an influential observation, you can determine whether that influence was based was because of high leverage or some other reason. Okay. Basically, if it has high leverage, it was an outlier in the x direction. If it did not have high leverage, it was it's probably influential because it was an outlier in the y direction. That's the basic basic idea. Anytime you find um, problem observations, you have to make a decision about what to do. The best choice to, is to go back to the original data. If you, you know, are familiar with the data collection process, and ask questions like, "How was this data collected? Could there be a, a recording errors?" Right. On average, we get um, at least one keystroke out of a hundred wrong. Often more than that. Um, but in data entry, even when you're being careful, you, you often make like one in a hundred um, mistakes and that are, are not caught. And that's why we often do double entry for data um, to try to, and then we match the entry to see that it's correct. Um, so, but if you can't go back to the original data, then you've got to make some decisions. In particular, you need to decide whether that point changes your inference. Does it change the regression model a lot? And if so, then you need to make another decision about, well, do I keep, do I do the analysis with that data point or without that data point, or do I present both analyses? Um, you know, hopefully you are in collaboration with someone who is at the source of the data and they can help make these types of decisions with you. Okay. So, um, here I'm going to switch over to our studio and we'll, uh, work there on this worksheet. It's not really a worksheet, it's just a, a supplement to to the chapter. All right. 
All right, so here were the suggestions that we, we just discussed. We actually don't need those as part of this document. All right, we will look at um, this thyroid data. So um, here I'm reading in the data set just from text. So if you read table and specify text, you can put the column names and you can put the values and uh, read it in. You specify that header equals true, so the, the first row are the column names. And here I'm also mutating to create a new column called ID, which we see down here, which just goes from 1 to N, which is the number of rows in the data set. So we've read in the data set and then also added an ID column. The structure of the data set um, is that we've got all numeric variables, so we'll be able to do some regression analysis pretty easily. Uh, later, next uh, semester, we'll work with numeric and categorical variables in a regression model. Let's uh, plot this data. Looks like we are... Um, so a couple features to notice right away. We're plotting X, uh, Y is the blood loss. Okay, X is the weight. So I think that the story of this data set um, is a thyroid. I think they're, they're like doing a um, maybe a thyroid octomy where they remove it, something like that. They're doing some sort of surgery and then um, most people are, lose about 500 milliliters or half a liter of blood in that in the course of the surgery. Um, I think the time is how many minutes it takes. And um, this is the weight. Mm, I'm not sure what this is. Maybe it's the weight of the thyroid, actually. Um, so anyway, we see this decreasing relationship between the weight variable and the blood loss. <clears throat> this... Uh, Video is not really about the context of the problem. It's more about analyzing the residuals. Okay, but I want to talk through it a little bit so that we know what we're looking at. Um, Geome point is putting the black points on there. Um, Geome text is printing the labels. So here the labels are the ID numbers, and this is helpful in cases when you want to identify specific outliers. So we created that ID variable and then we're going to use it to label the points. This is a great thing to do, um, especially if you identify an issue and you want to go back to the data and, and determine which observations gave you the issues. Um, and then Geome Smooth is plotting the regression line and the method equals LM. The default is a straight line. And then you can see that we've got standard error bars and they are narrowest where x equals x bar, and they are wider as you move away from x bar. Okay. Um, what do we see here? We see that the you know relationship looks fine. We've got this outlying value in terms of the x. I don't really want to call it an outlier. Just that um, all the weights are between I don't know thirty six or something up to just over 50 and then here's one that's 70 it's like a the distance between observation 8 and 3 is almost the same span as the width of all the other data combined right so it's it's a bit of an outlier in terms of its weight um, what else X uh, observation 8 is maybe the largest residual in terms of its vertical distance oh. so so it could be that um, you know this observation is is incorrectly recorded. Maybe instead of sixty nine, it was meant to be forty nine or something. All right. So let's fit a, a linear regression. Uh, we'll use the LM function, and the data is the DAT thyroid, where the Y variable is blood loss, tilde X variable is weight. We're going to save the linear model object as LM blood weight um, and then we'll look at the summary just briefly okay <clears throat> so the summary itself is not very interesting at this moment 
because we are not confident about whether this model fits the data well. So we should be slow in interpreting these intercept and slope parameters, um, except that they match the blue line here. Okay. So let's do some of our residual diagnostics. So in the old days, <laughs> um, not long ago, you had to like actually do all of the individual plots. Okay. And so let's let's replace all this stuff with the function that I wrote, um, e plot linear model diagnostics, and you just need to pass it the linear model object, and we will get a set of plots. Oh, we do want to do one more thing. This is going to give us more plots than we want right now. So if we look at the help for that function, we will see an option here. Let me make this text a little bit bigger. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to clear all the plots. We see that there's a switch for the plot set and simple. Um, simple is going to be just right for us. All right, and that's going to give us a six pack of plots. The first plot is uh, for normality. Down here it says normal quantiles. And on the vertical axis are the residuals. And we've got um, a diagonal line that if the residuals, if the distribution of the residuals followed a normal distribution, then these points would follow this diagonal line. And they sort of start low, and then they go high, and then they go low again relative to the diagonal line. So there's a little bit of... Um, curvature here actually. However, we also have a small data set. We don't have a ton of evidence against normality. Normality here in terms of a hypothesis test, the null hypothesis would be that the data are normal and we assess evidence against that to say that the data are not normal in the alternative hypothesis. Um, these, the bands give you some, some bounds for um, if the points are outside of those bands and you have a bunch of them outside, then that's increasing evidence against normality. In this case, they're all inside the bands. Um, I don't think we've got strong evidence here for, um, for violation of normality. <clears throat> all right, the second plot is Cook's distance. That's how much um, the predicted values changed because one point was in the data set versus not. And here we can see all the lever all the influence Cook's distance values are very low except for observation three. So if we go back and look at the previous plot, observation three is the one way out here. Okay, so without that point, you can see that point's probably pulling up. Um, I guess it's sort of like this. It's pulling up that regression line. On, on that end. Without that point, the line would probably be a steeper slope than what we um, see here. All right, so that's probably that influence. If we look at the third plot, we have the same Cook's distance on the y-axis. You can see it's identical to this one, to the second plot. But on the x-axis, we have it have leverage. That's how far a point is relative to on the x-axis relative to the mean of x. So points that are close to zero have an x value close to the mean, and values that with higher leverage are um, toward the extreme tails, positive or negative, in terms of the x variable. And here in the upper right-hand corner is the value 3. So it's, it's influential in the Cook's dis distance because it has high leverage. All right. So... We're just following that away. We'll probably remove this point pretty soon and see what what the regression line looks like without it. All right, here is the residuals versus fitted values. Now we only have eight points here. I recommend to you to ignore these red lines that are s smoothing lines that are supposed to help catch your eye and 
and see if there's any patterns. Um, but they are often a little too sensitive and are following the points a little too carefully, whereas uh, there's no real structure in the in these um, residual points here. <clears throat> For relative, so this is the same similar plot. We have got residuals, but relative to the x variable of weight, and um, this actually is just the same as the fitted values, but flipped left and right, um, because we only have one regressor, one predictor variable in the model. Um, and the box Cox transformation. So if you had decided that the normality was not being met and you wanted to think about what transformation should I make, the box Cox power transformation is a transformation of Y. I put a little comment down here. Um, it's a transformation of Y where you raise it to an exponent, okay? So here you can't even see the, the bounds. This is a, a downward facing curve, like an upside down parabola. And there's usually two bars, two dashed bars that that drop down to the x-axis. And the x-axis are exponents that you would try to raise the y variable to um, to improve normality. Um, anyway, it's not this is not a good example for showing that one. Okay, so let's take a look. Um, so we've looked at uh, curvature, constant variance. Yeah, so I would say there's no real curvature here in terms of like a like happy face or something, or a downward face. There's no issue in terms of constant variance. Like you just don't have enough information to to make those claims right now. Um, we did see an influential point because of high leverage. Okay. <clears throat> so one thing that we can try is we there's two ways to deal with this. We can either exclude the point. Oh, okay, so we, let's exclude the point. There's two ways to exclude it. One way is to remove the point from the data set and rerun the code. Another way is to set the weight in the regression model um, equal to zero for that point. So every point has a weight, sort of how important it is. And by default, the weight of each point is equal to one. If we set one of them equal to zero, then it's in the data set, but it doesn't contribute any information to the regression model, okay? So well, that's, that's the strategy we're gonna take here. We're gonna create a new variable called weight, WT, and we're going to check to see whether the ID of the number is equal to three. If it is, then we're gonna set the weight equal to zero. Otherwise, we'll set the weight equal to one. So if we run this and look at those weights, we'll see one, one, and we have a zero for observation three. We can also just look at the whole data set because it's tiny here for observation three, um, where weight equals 69, the weight equals zero. All right, so now we can fit the same model, blood versus weight, with the same data set, except now the weights are going to be based on the weight column in the data set. And we're going to call this linear model object the same thing except no number three. Okay. So here is the model fit. Um, it has a different intercept and slope and a different R squared value, etc. Let's uh, not worry too much about that, but look at the plot. Hmm. So it looks like I'm also um, going to create a data set that has no number three, where I filter out and keep all the observations that have a weight equal to one. All right, so I'll run that, and then we'll create the, the plot. Okay, so that's what the data look like. Uh, it might be interesting to plot both of these data sets together on the same uh, plot. All right, let's see if there's an easy way to do that data. Okay, um, let's do that. Let's let's do uh, let's create this plot um, where we where we plot both regression lines. Okay, 
So recall our previous um, plot was basically just that, where the data was the, the dat thyroid. Now we can have a color equals blue. Okay, that's already color equals blue. And also let's do um, standard error equals false. I think that's how that goes. It's a lowercase se. Okay, so with the full data set, there we go. We've got a blue line. And if we get a warning down here, I usually read it, but I think we're, we're good here. All right. <clears throat> Now, we want to create another smooth line. Let's do red. And you know what? Well, maybe we'll also do line type equals, uh, I think, is it called solid? Um, and then I know line type equals dashed. OK. OK. And but the dashed one, we want the data set to come from no three. Okay. All right. Let's see if this works. Um, we might need to add a different formula. Ah, perfect. Okay. So we see the regression line with observation three, and we see it without observation three. There's one more option here somewhere about the extent of the line because we really don't see how far this this how different this line is when it's way out here at observation three because it stops at observation eight um, but there's some way uh, span oh no full range equals true okay so I think this option will match the line to the full range of the x variable. Okay, so that's how much influence observation three had. It pulled the red line up to where the blue line is, and it changed all the predictions for the other seven points. Okay, that demonstration went uh, perfectly. <laughs> um, the other thing I would add here, because now we've got multiple lines, is create a label. Uh, caption equals blue solid is you know full data red dashed is without observation three okay oops okay so now there's a little caption at the bottom to define what what's there okay that's sort of the end of of that let's look at the diagnostics for this regression. Remember, that's what we were do working on. <laughs> uh, so we've, we've got this new function, right? Plot uh, LM diagnostics for that linear model. Let's not write all this code, but replace it with that single line. Oh, we also want the the plot set to be simple. So here we have, oh, something is weird. Look at observation three. Oh, okay. That's interesting. So um, I haven't, I don't really use the weighting um, very much. Um, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, there's seven observations here. That's right. Okay, so observation three looks like it may not follow a normal distribution or it sort of an outlying point. Um, we have such a small data set that I don't really see that as very being very strong evidence um, against normality. Uh, to Cook's distance, these points, you know, we've got one that's a bit higher than the others. Observation, it's labeled with an eight. So that's the, that's the ID number in the data set. Um, it's now observation seven in the sequence of the values because we removed observation three. So observation four became three, 
five became four, etc., until eight became seven. Um, uh, we don't really have, but I would say that there there's not much of a issue here. It's really hard to tell. It's because these values are are quite small over here. Um, uh, we we have a high leverage point, but it doesn't have, but has very low influence. Okay. Anyway, this this is looking fine to me. That we just have such a small data set, it's hard to really say anything um, against the null hypotheses of normality, equal variance, and so on. You know, we have this one point out here, but everything else is down here. I don't know. It's sort of fine. <clears throat> Oh, residuals versus weights. Interesting. I've never. I don't use weights very often, so it's not. This is not a very informative plot over here. So we've got um, a situation where we don't really have any issues with the diagnostics, and so then we would need to make some decision about: Are we going to? Um, which model are we going to use to do our interpretation? Okay. Um, let's just take a quick look at the predicted values um, with, so this is the predicted value for weight 50. So let's go back to our data set. Here's weight 50 sort of in the middle. So if we wanted to predict a new observation, so how much blood loss would you expect for someone whose weight was 50? What range of Y values would you expect? Okay. And so we are doing an interval equal prediction for that weight of 50. And based on our full data set linear model, and then the linear model without observation three. And how much did our inference change? Our fitted values are pretty similar, um, 487 versus 482. And our intervals are, you know, is one quite a bit wider or not than the other? Um, it looks like this range is about 60, and this range is about 60, 59. So the inference didn't really change very much. The, the, the mean you know, is higher by about six points, but it's about the same. So in terms of predicting observation, you know, weight equal 50, um, with or without three didn't change, change it very much. It probably has more of it it definitely has more influence maybe at the very left edge. Um, anyway, again, we have a very small data set and uh, um, hard to have much influence, much uh, evidence for, for anything. All right, let's uh, go on to the next example, the Gessel data. So this is um, a UCLA study of cyanic uh, uh, heart disease in children. So we've got um, this score, which is the a score of their heart disease. We have the, the kid's age. I guess most of these are teenagers. Looks like we've got a 42 in here. Um, so that is probably a data recording error. We have a, also a 26, which seems unusually large. Um, so anyway, those are things to look out for us to look out for. Uh, we already have an ID in this column. All right, so we'll load the data. Very good. And we'll start by plotting the data. Yeah, so here's the, notice all the data here is between about, you know, eight or nine years old up to about 20. And then there's this 26 year old and someone who's in their 40s. So, Clearly, we've got a major issue with leverage, leverage here in terms of an outlier in the x direction. And you can imagine if you exclude these two points, what would the regression line look like? To my eye, it's looking basically horizontal. Okay, so maybe there's no association between age and their score. All right, so we'll fit the regression model because that's how we can do our diagnostics. Let's go up and copy one of the um, regression diagnostic functions and we'll put that here so the linear model object is LM score age I'll remove the rest of this stuff 
and we'll run the diagnostics. All right, so in terms of normality, the point looks pretty good. We have one outlying value, number 19. Um, interesting, it's, it's not the one that's most influential. Um, so where, how do you get outliers in terms of the residuals? Those are the, so the res residuals are the vertical spaces around the regression line. So let's take a look at the vertical space around the regression line. Observation 19 is way up here, right? It's really high. It's about, I don't know, almost uh, 30 uh, units above the regression line, whereas the rest of them are within about 10 units because each of these white lines is about 10 units. So, you know, 10 to 20 units, whereas this one is whatever I just said. <laughs> Uh, looks like about 30. So this one has a huge residual, um, but it's also near the middle of the data. So this is going to be maybe influential, but not, but has low leverage. Okay, we've seen that example at the beginning of the video. So we've got uh, observation 18. That's the one way out here in the tail on the right hand side. So it has high leverage. Um, that is the most influential value. Um, but 19 is influential also. Um, it's the one that's in the middle, 19, with the large residual. So we should watch out for those. Um, in the leverage, uh, Cook's distance by leverage plot, we can see 19 is that, or 18 is that point here in the corner. Um, and then uh, observation 19 is right here along basically where the blue line is. The rest, all the rest of the points are down here in the corner because they're not influential or outliers. <clears throat> um, in terms of the residual plot versus or the residuals versus fitted values, we have one re really large residual. The rest of it looks pretty good. We have one observation out here. That's that's observation 18, but it's only one point by itself. So we really can't say anything about non-constant variance, right? Um, and as we get to a domain of X where we have more values, we also see more spread. So it it's, follows the pattern that, that we sort of expect, except for observation 19, which has a very large residual. Um, relative to age, it's the same plot, just flipped left and right. Um, <clears throat> looks like, and then here's finally a box Cox transformation that if we wanted to get the data to make the residuals more normal, what transformation of Y would we perform? Well, let's take a look at over here again. These points follow the line pretty well. The, the typical patterns that you're looking for are either um, a U shape, up or down, um, or an S shape. Okay, a U shape means that there's skewness. And an S shape means that there's kurtosis, high kurtosis, called leptokurtotic. When you've got like a bunch of points that are close to the middle, and then you've got ex really extreme points on either side. That uh, kurtosis is how pointy the data are and, uh, and how much outlying points you have in both directions. In this case, we uh, really just have this one point out here that makes this look maybe curved. But without that point, the rest of the points follow the normal distribution just fine. So I'm satisfied with normality. Therefore, I would not look at the box Cox transformation. However, this is how you would interpret it. Um, the, so we're looking at y raised to the power lambda. Lambda actually looks like an upside down y. And so if y was raised to 1, that's this uh, orange dash line, um, that's no transformation, right? Y to the one power. Anything to the one power is itself. Um, then we've got this upside down U. Um, the peak is telling us what the best transformation is to make the data the most normal. Okay, And that's actually close to zero. And we typically round it maybe to an integer or maybe to a middle value. Like, like if it was close to one half, we might take the square root because y to the one half is the same as the square root. Um, but in this case, it's pretty close to zero, so may, we might think of um, now y to the zero power, anything raised to the zero is equal to one. 
but there's a there's a mathematical result here that the limit as you get close to zero it actually approaches the logarithm and logarithm transformation so if you get close to zero you'd think about performing the log and then um, this curve has a horizontal line that intersects the curve and at those intersection points it gives us a lower bound for lambda and an upper bound for lambda so any transformation between roughly negative two up to two and a half would be a sensible transformation to use. In this case, one in, is inside of that interval, which means that we don't need to make a transformation because it's inside the range that helps us get to new normality. Um, sometimes you see this curve being very sharp um, with these bounds being very narrow. And that typically happens when you have large sample sizes because you'll have more and more evidence for a particular transformation. Um, so anyway, what do we have here? We've got this outlying value. Um, does our inference change? Um, in fact, let's go back one. We actually sort of have these two points that are influential in two different ways, right? We've got a high leverage point 18, and we have a, a large residual 19. So we might want to look at each of the each of the models with without one or the other or both of these points and and see how different um, the plots look. Why don't we go through and um, do that? So I don't have any additional analysis in the document, but let's um, just as we annotated the previous plot. Let's do that here as well. All right. Uh, sorry, let me grab. I'm going to grab the basically the geome smooth lines because that's what's going to tell me how things change. All right. So we have the original one. So I'm going to run the first bit of code, okay, down through the first geome smooth. And then I'm going to just print P and see what I've got so far. All right. To that, I'm going to add the Gessel data, but I'm going to filter the data. So look at here. I'm going to, I'm going to change the data in line and then pass that change data into the geom smooth function. Okay. So here we've got ID. I'm going to filter wherever ID. Um, let's do it this way equal to 18, but then I'm going to negate it. Okay, so wherever the ID is not equal to 18, I'm going to plot a red dashed line. So I'm going to, without observation, 18. So let's, let's overlay that line. Cool. So that was the effect of 18. Let's look at the effect of without 19. All right, without 19, and I apologize to those of you who are red, green, colorblind. I'll use green, but I will use a dotted line. Okay, so green dotted is without observation 19, and let's run that line. Hmm, let's see. Oh, uh, without 19. Without 19. Oh, it's there. It's just almost invisible. <laughs> um, let's let's um, change the, let's see if this helps. Um, theme BW. Uh, make a, bl a white background. I don't know. Green is almost uh, impossible to see. Uh, what are other colors? Purple? <clears throat> okay, there's a purple dotted line. Ah, cool. So this is this shows um, exactly what we saw in the examples from the notes. Observation 19, with, with it, we get the blue line. 
Without it, we get the purple dotted line. So it shifted the whole regression line, pulled the whole regression line up. Cool. And then what happens if we, we remove both of them? Um, so here we want to say where ID is not in the list 18 and 19. Um, the function in is looking in a list. So is, is 19, is the ID number in the list of 18 and 19? Um, if it is, then remove it. That's sort of what's happening. And I need another color. Blue? No. <laughs> uh, orange? Let's do orange. And there's some... Hmm, I think we'll do solid again. Um, just because I'm not very creative. Um, okay, so there's the orange line. So if you remove both observations 18 and 19, you end up sort of where you started again with the blue line. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> so what would I do? <laughs> um, 19 definitely seems to be changing the slope in a big way, um, but it doesn't really change the inference very much over this range of points. Um, let's see. If we make this a little bit bigger for you. So the main range of the points are, these are people's ages from, you know, 8 years old to 20 years old. All of these regression lines in this range are pretty similar. And, um, you know, it... It does, observation 18 seems to be the most influential, especially for these older aged um, kids. Um, yeah, so here's a couple things. So the beginning of this um, analysis said that this was for um, the age of the child in, oh, in months, sorry, in months. Yeah, so, but this um, at first word, so, okay, I should have read the whole thing at the beginning, right? Predictor of the age of the child in months at the first word. So the first time they said a word, right? Daddy. <laughs> um, so we got 20 months. Uh, that's almost two years. Um, so I might, if, so if I was, if this was my study, I might limit the scope of the analysis and say for kids, um, I'm going to, I'm going to reduce the, the analysis to, to people who are, to kids who start speaking, say, by 20 months, something like that. And maybe even exclude this point number two here, because almost all the data is there. The two and the 18 are sort of unusual cases. And maybe this model, maybe this relationship isn't a straight line relationship, um, you know, all the way um, you know, to infinity for ages, for a number of months. So, because we've got X outliers, um, that, that would be one way to handle that, that, that I'm going to develop a model for just ages less than or equal to 20 and, and fit that model. Then you just have to deal with observation 19 as being a bit of an outlier there. Um, in fact, can we take another minute? Um, and what happens if we filter? Okay, I'm going to make, I'm going to copy this plot. And I'm uh, just going to move to the bottom. And I'm going to filter the data where um, age is less than or equal to 20. Okay, and I'm going to remove all the additional smooth lines. Um, you know what? I, what I'll do is I'll just add this filter to each of these. Okay. Sorry, this is a bit intense. So let's do this one at a time. Ah, so if I remove, a, you know, here's on the right side of my x-axis, we have 20. So without those two observations, 18 and 2, 
There's no downward slope, except maybe 19 is, is exerting leverage upwards and changing. Maybe there's a slight downward slope except for 19, right? But the, the point being here that, that maybe, the, maybe this relationship is sort of horizontal and then decreases, right? Um, lots of patterns are not, you know, do not follow a linear progression. Think about um, human height as a function of age, right? Um, you're born <laughs> in your certain height, right? And then you increase roughly linearly through your teenage years, and then you start to plateau. And eventually you stay the same height for a long time. And then you get old and your vertebrae compress, and then you get a little bit shorter, and then you die. So that is not a linear relationship. Um, and this may not be a linear relationship either. We might have a horizontal relationship and then a downward decrease. Or maybe if you just remove observation 19, as we've seen, maybe it does follow this downward trend. So to me, it seems like we need more data to, to support some of those hypotheses because there's also these points down here, you know, right? Without the, these few points down here, it looks like there's a downward relationship uh, trend here, you know, are these the outlying points? It's really hard to tell when you have small sample sizes. I think if we were to get up, you know, two or four times as many points, we would have more evidence for some of these competing ideas about what the model should be. Okay, well, we've done a lot of discussion here. I think that's sufficient for this um, video. I will keep all of this code in this file and post it online so that you can um, take a look at it. All right, see you in the next one.